welcome, welcome, welcome to this channel, Baruch Abba Bashem Yahuwah. And today we do part 16 of the 42 counting in-depth study series, The Spiritual Man. So, we still have some parts to go. 28 to be precise. The title for today is A Spiritual Man. And subtitles are The Dividing of Spirit and Soul, United to the Master in One Spirit, uh, Knowing the Indwelling of the Holy Spirit or Ruach HaKodesh, and the strengthening of the Holy Spirit and walking according to the Spirit. So it's quite a long part. So let's start. And always have my pen with me. A person whose spirit is regenerated and within, whom the Holy Spirit abides can still be fleshly, for his spirit may yet be under the oppression of his soul and body. This is a very important piece of information. I will uh, read this again. This is the first part known as the spiritual man. So a person whose spirit is regenerated and within whom the Holy Spirit abides can still be fleshly, can still be fleshly, for his spirit may yet be under the oppression of his soul and body. Not or body, and body, because the soul and body are working in togetherness. Because the body is directing the soul, and the soul is trying to direct your spirit. Due to the fall, the order is changed. So the body became the head, and the spirit became the tail, so to speak. In the original order, it was spirit, soul, body, which is, of course, logic. Because our spirit gets the orders from the Holy Spirit or Ruach HaKodesh which is the Ruach of our Universal Father the Most High then our spirit gets the orders our spirit passes the, these orders forward to the soul and the soul needs to pass the orders exactly as it has received them from our spirit unto the body so that the body will uh, bring them into manifestation so into form that is how it supposed to work but due to the fall of mankind um, this immediately changed so now the body thinks that it is the head and the soul is thinking that it can uh, give its orders to the spirit. So now it is the body gives the orders to the soul and the soul gives the orders to the spirit, which is absurd. And with this, the spirit became more or less the tail. Generally speaking, we will encounter at least two great perils in our life, but are enabled to overcome not only the first, but the second of them as well, which is the soul. These two perils, one is the body, the other is the soul, with their corresponding triumphs are that of remaining a perishing sinner or becoming a safe believer and that of a continuing as a fleshly believer or developing into a spiritual one.
as sinner turned believer is uh, demonstrably realizable. So carnal dash turned dash spiritual is likewise attainable. The Most High who can change a sinner into a believer by giving him his life, so the life that comes from the Most High, can equally transform the fleshly believer into a spiritual believer, one by giving him his life, so again the life of the Most High himself, more abundantly. Faith in Mashiach, Yeshua makes one a regenerated believer, obedience to the Holy Spirit or Ruach HaKodesh makes him a spiritual believer, just as the right relationship with Mashiach generates a believer, so the proper relationship with the Holy Spirit breeds a spiritual man. And if I say Holy Spirit, I also at the same time mean Ruach HaKodesh. But for many, the term Holy Spirit is more known. So the Spirit alone can render believers spiritual. It is His work to bring men into spirituality in the arrangement of the Most High's redemptive design, the stake performs the negative work of destroying all which comes from Adam. While the Holy Spirit executes the positive work of building all which comes from Mashiach. So, one process, it is destroying everything that comes from Adam in us, in our spirit, in our soul, and in our body. And then, at the same time, the Holy Spirit is also building you up into becoming a spiritual human that can walk the same path as Mashiach Yeshua walked. The stake makes spiritually spirituality possible to believers. But it is the Holy Spirit who renders them spiritual. The meaning of being spiritual is to belong to the Holy Spirit. He strengthens with might uh, the human spirit so as to govern the entire man. In our pursuit of spirituality, therefore, we must never forget the Holy Spirit. Yet we must not set aside the stake either, because the stake and the spirit work hand in hand. The stake always guides men to the Holy Spirit, while the latter, without fail, conducts men to the stake. These two never operate independently of each other. A spiritual believer must experimentally know the Holy Spirit in his spirit. He must pass through several spiritual experiences. For the sake of clarity, we shall discuss them in a somewhat sequential fashion, although in actual practice they frequently occur simultaneously. Quite a few remarks will be made concerning how to be spiritual. But let us not forget what we have learned here to for. So that is why it is of very importance that you have listened to the former parts, the former 15 parts of this study. Then you can follow this, what is now being laid out here. We should realize by now that what hinders 
one from being spiritual is the flesh. And there are many, many, many people that believers, people who claim to be believers, that are stuck in their flesh. And if you confront them with uh, saying, but you are now saying things out of jealousy, and jealousy is flesh that's coming from pride, one of the roots of pride, then such a believer still denies that. As long as you are still in the denying modus that you are still operating from the flesh, you need to question something here. Why are you still in the flesh? Why have you difficulties with acknowledging the fact that you are being confronted with the hardness of hearing that you are still operating from the flesh. I'm not saying that I'm not doing either. I also see in myself that I have things that are still coming from the flesh. So I'm also not there yet. This, this, this shell that is around uh, this, my spirit, this, this, this soul part in me, is still not completely crushed. The natural strength is in me is not completely crushed and broken down. Natural strength is your natural humanness, is the flesh, is Adam, and everything that is related to Adam. But it is worse if you deny. By denying, you open a door to unclean spirits because they love it when you deny something. Especially denying the fact that you're still operating from the flesh. And if I confront such people with that, then they say, no, 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 I'm not meaning it like this and blah, blah, blah. That's exactly what the flesh is doing. A spiritual human shall never say, oh, no, 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 I don't mean that. And no, why is someone saying such a thing? Because the flesh wants to defend itself from hearing a truth-based comment from someone who clearly sees that the person itself is still operating from its flesh. And the flesh always defends itself by saying, Oh no, I didn't mean it that way. You do not understand me. Ah, uh ah. -uh. Then you're not in your spiritual humanness. Because the spiritual humanness would react in a way such as this. Oh, okay, thank you for telling me that I still have something that is related to the flesh. Thank you for appointing me to the fact that I now operate from my flesh. And then you can start to overcome and overrule the flesh with your spirit, with your spiritual humanness. But as soon as you start immediately saying, Oh no, but I didn't mean it that way and you do not understand me. That is the flesh. Because the flesh doesn't like to be confronted with truth. Many people do not see this. Many have their eyes still closed and they uh, call themselves spiritual. I do not call myself spiritual. 
I see myself still in the process of undoing myself from this whole carnal based nonsense naturalness. So if a person maintains a proper attitude towards it, he shall encounter no difficulty in making progress. It is surprisingly true that the more spiritual one becomes, the more he knows the flesh. Yeah. And the more you're going to see it um, in others working out. Because you only can see what I have stated before is, is something that you only can see if you yourself start to operate more and more from your spiritual humanness. And then you can see it in others. And then you can see in others how the flesh is playing itself through and out. But also in yourself. Because he increasingly discovers it. Had he not known it, how could he be spiritual? Exactly. If you are still operating from your nonsense carnal, n natural humanness and natural strength, how then can you know that your reactions are actually carnal-based reactions? natural human based reactions you can't so what are you doing as soon as you are being confronted you defend yourselves that's the difference hence we cannot neglect what has been discussed earlier concerning the flesh since it serves as the basis for seeking spirituality unless there is this fundamental dealing with the flesh whatever progress one makes shall um, yeah shall inevitably be superficial shallow and unreal wow let's Let's say this again. Hence, we cannot neglect what has been discussed earlier concerning the flesh, since it serves as the basis for seeking spirituality. So you have two types of spirituality. One that is due to the seeking of the carnal to become spiritual and carnal cannot become spiritual because it's made from dust what is dust i think dust is fallen star dust materialized as so-called clay dust just to think, something to think about so and then um, we have the spirituality that comes from our spiritual humanness. So we have a spirituality coming from the natural humanness, which is the carnal, the flesh-based human. And then we have a spirituality coming from our spiritual humanness, spirit-based. That's a, there are, These are the two with a huge difference unless there is this fundamental dealing with the flesh whatever progress one make shall inevitably be superficial shallow and unreal and this is also what I see the fake humbleness the fake meekness Many believers carry a fake meekness and a fake humbleness. But if one knows how to resist his flesh in all things, denying 
its activity, power, and um, opinion, he may be regarded as already spiritual. Nevertheless, we would still like to cite some positive measure, measures which are related directly to the spirit. And how can you deny the, the, the uh, activities, power, and opinions of the flesh by every day starting your day with first thanking the Most High that you have been given a new, new day, do your pr uh, praise and worship, and uh, then you are asking the Most High to order your steps for that day, to lead you in all your ways that day, and ask him how you can fulfill his needs and then you do only things that the most high has ordered you to do this is one of the ways to deny the flesh the other way is do uh, is by doing frequently fasting and start to change your diet by eating lesser meat lesser dairy products and products of which you know that the flesh likes to eat so the second part is the dividing of spirit and soul the salient implication of hebrews 4 verse 12 is whether we are living by intuitive guidance in the spirit or by the naturally good or bad influence of the soul. The word of the Most High must judge in this particular respect. For only the Most High's sharp sword can differentiate the source of our living as a man's knife cuts and divides joints and marrow so does the word of the most high two pierces and separates the most intimately linked spirit and soul initially such dividing may be simply a matter of knowledge but it is essential that it enters the realm of experience. Otherwise, it shall, in fact, never be understood. Believers should allow the Master to introduce this cleaving of spirit and soul into their practical walk. So ask for this. Give the Holy Spirit, or Ruach, HaKodesh, your permission to do the disciplinal work in your spirit and in your soul by also using the power of the stake and give the Most High your saying that you are agreed with the fact that He sets asunder or cleaves your spirit from your soul. Because if you say it yourselves, then he knows that you are fully in agreement with the entire process that he is doing in you. Not only must they seek it positively with consecration, prayer, and yieldedness to the operation of the Holy Spirit and the stake, but also they must actually possess such experience. Their spirit needs to be liberated from the soul's binding enclosure. These two must be parted cleanly, even as the spirit and soul of the master, Yeshua, were not one bit mixed. The intuitive spirit needs to be freed wholly from any influence which may come from solical mind and emotion. I dare to say that actually the spirit and soul of 
Yeshua HaMashiach was already from the beginning separated from each other and wasn't operating as uh, is going on in us. Why? Because he was not just an ordinary man. The body that he was in was already completely cleansed from it and recorrected. It was mer a flesh body, but it didn't have all the things, the downfall from Adam in it. That's why he could do what he could do. Otherwise, if that wasn't the case, he had a tremendous dealing with being in the flesh, but he didn't. He didn't get the dealings as we, as we have on daily basis with our flesh. He didn't had this. His body was a chosen body. The mother that birthed him was a mother that was chosen beforehand to do that job. And the body of uh, Yeshua, he operated in when he was here on earth, was free from sin, didn't got any dealings due to the fall of Adam and Eve. That's why he could do what he could do because he was not an ordinary man. And that's the difference between uh, the Son of the Most High and us. The intuitive spirit needs to be freed wholly from any influence with, um, from any influence which may come from solical mind and emotion. So the intuitive spirit needs to be freed wholly from any influence which may come from solical mind and emotion. And many, if not all believers, there's just a small percentage of believers whom are not operating from a solical mind and emotion. The majority of believers in this world are still operating from a solical mind and emotion. They are still led by emotions. And we are not being led by emotions. Yeshua wasn't also led by emotions. He maybe uh, did a few times a weeping. But that was because of a very, uh, of the fact that he uh, was experiencing something with very dear, dear people whom were dear to him. But uh, most of the time, and I can say for at least 99% 99, 99 of the time, the master, Yeshua, didn't let himself being ruled by emotions. He never did. Because he knew that what, that, uh, because he knew that was coming from the soul. So that's why the Most High is speaking these words through me by saying the majority of believers is still operating from a solical mind and emotion. So the spirit must be soul residence and office of the Holy Spirit. In other words, the soul must be submissive and submitted to the authority of the Holy Spirit or Ruach HaKodesh, which is, of course, the Spirit of the Most High, our Universal Father. 
it must be released from every disturbance of the soul. What I say and what the Most High has taught me through His Holy Spirit is that the soul is actually the intercessor between the body and the spirit. You can say it forms a bridge function between the body and the spirit. The various experiences of having this outer and inner man divided will make a believer spiritual. So all those people who see, whom you see around you, whom are proclaiming that they are spiritual and are living a life that is completely the opposite, contrary to it, these are not spiritual people. Because these people are outliving a spirituality that is directed by their flesh, by their soul, by their natural strength, by their natural humanness. The various experiences of having his outer and inner man divided will make a believer spiritual. A spiritual believer differs from others for the simple reason that his entire being is governed by his spirit. Such spirit control connotes more than the Holy Spirit's authority over the soul and body of man. And if the Holy Spirit or Ruach HaKodesh has complete authority over your soul and body, which means that the Most High, our Universal Father, the El Elyon, has complete control over your soul and body. So your soul and body must be submissive and have themselves completely submitted to his authority. Uh, Holy Spirit of man. Of, uh, man. It also signifies that man's own spirit, upon being elevated as head over the whole man, through the working, through the working of the Holy Spirit. And the stake is no longer ruled by the soul and body, but is powerful enough to subject them to its rule. Its rule means the rule that comes from the Holy Spirit. Because our spirit gets the orders from the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of our Universal Father, the Most High, the El Elyon. So the division of these two organs is necessary for entering spiritual life. If this is not happening in you, you need to ask questions to the Father in uh, how it is possible that you still are not having a life lived from your spiritual humanness. And then the Father will show you exactly what is going on and how you are still participating yourselves in your natural humanness. The division of these two organs is necessary for entering spiritual life. It is that preparation without which believers shall continue to be affected by the soul and hence shall always pursue a mixed course, sometimes walking according to the spirit life, but at other times walking according to the natural life. Their pathway fails to be marked by purity, for both 
spirit, and soul are their life principles. This mixture holds believers fast within a soulish framework which damages their walk as well as hinders the important work of the spirit. Were a believer's outer and inner life definitely separated so that he walks not according to the former but according to the latter, he would sense instantaneously any movement in his soul and immediately shake off its power and influence like a duck does. You know, this. That's what a duck is doing. If it feels unclean then, or feels that it, it, you know, something is not right, what does a bird do? Ooh, this. It shakes it off. Well, that is the same thing you do when you feel that something is coming from your soul. Then you shake it off and say to your soul, no. You have no thing to say. You have to be obedient to the Spirit. I'm not listening to you, so. And shake off its power and influence as though being defiled. Indeed, everything belonging to the soulish is defiled and can devile the spirit. But upon experiencing the partition of soul and spirit, the latter's intuitive power becomes most keen. As soon as the soul steers, the spirit suffers. So that is why you, that is why this, the, the cleaving of spirit and soul must happen. If it doesn't take place, you are constantly suffering your own spirit. Well, own spirit, it is, of course, a spirit that is being created by the Most High himself. So if your spirit, or better said, if the spirit and the soul are not cleaved from each other, then the spirit suffers continuously due to the oppression coming from the soul and will resist right away. The spirit may even be grieved at the inordinate steering of the soul in others. I'm going to say this again because this is very important to grasp. As soon as the soul steers, the spirit suffers and will resist right away. The spirit may even be grieved at the inordinate steering of the soul in others. So even the things, the steering up, done by the soul in another person, can make your spirit grieve. See how it works here. It will, in fact, repulse a person's soulish love or natural affection as something unbearable. What you get is this feeling like, I don't know, I, 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 you get irritation because that comes, sometimes irritation can also come from your spirit due to the suffering and the grief it is going through and, and the resistance to resist that what is coming from the other person. Please grasp this because this is very important. If you can grasp this, Wow, then you have made a huge step in understanding the dynamics between soul and spirit. 
Only after experiencing such separations do believers come into possession of a genuine sense of cleanliness. They then know that not sin alone, but all which belongs to the soulish is defiled and deviling and um, ought to be resisted. Nay, it is far more than simply knowing for any contact with what is soulish, whether in themselves or in others, causes their intuitive spirit to feel defiled and to demand instant cleansing all right united to the master in one spirit in his first corinthian letter paul informed his readers that whoever is united to the master yahshua becomes one spirit with him corinthians chapter 6 verse 17 and note that he did not say one soul with him no he didn't say the risen master yeshua is the life giving spirit 1st uh, Corinthians or Corinthians yeah now first 1st Corinthians 15 verse 45 his union with the believer is therefore a union with the believers spirit not with the believers body with the believers spirit not with the believers soul no, with the believer's spirit. The soul, the seat of man's personality, please understand this, that the soul is the seat of man's personality. It's part of the flesh. Belongs to the natural. What do I say? Is part of the flesh. All it can and is to be is a vessel for expressing the fruit of the union between the master Yeshua and the believers in our man. Nothing in his soul partakes of the master's life. It is solely in the spirit that such a union is affected. The union is one of the spirits with no place for the natural. Should it be mixed in with the spirit, it will cause impurity to the union of spirits. What does the Most High say? I communion with you in the spirit, in the spirit realm. What does the Most High say in His Word also? That He uh, has a disgusting for everything that comes from the flesh. You do not please Him by the works of your flesh. You only please Him if you worship Him in spirit and in truth. Any action taking, any action taken according to our thought, opinion, or feeling can weaken the experimental side of this union. Things of the same nature unite perfectly, inasmuch as the spirit of the master is pure 
ours likewise needs to be as pure in order to be united truly with him if a believer clings to his own wonderful ideas and is unwilling to lay aside his preference and opinion his union with the master will not be expressed in experience the union of spirits permits no adulteration from anything soulish so the union of spirits permits no adulteration from anything soulish <clears throat> wherein lies this union interesting to know it is in the identification with Mashiach, Yeshua, in his death and resurrection. If we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Romans 6, verse 5. This verse explains our union with the master as one of being united with his death and resurrection this simply indicates we are completely one with him <clears throat> by accepting his death as our death we enter into this union with the master by additionally accepting his resurrection, we who have died with him shall be resurrected as well. Through faith, acceptance of his resurrection, we shall stand ex experientially in the place of resurrection because the master, Yeshua, was raised from the dead according to the spirit of holiness. Romans 1 verse uh, 4 and was made alive in the spirit 1 Peter 3 18 we too when united with him in resurrection actually are united with him in his resurrected spirit we are united in his resurrected spirit henceforth we are dead to everything pertaining to ourselves and alive to his spirit alone this requires our exercising faith once identified with with his death we lose the sinful and the natural in us so once identified with his death we lose the sinful and the natural in us once identified with his resurrection we are united with his resurrection life Hmm. Thus our being, which is now united with the Master, Yeshua, becomes one spirit with him. You have died through the body of Mashiach, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead so that we serve in the new life of the spirit romans 7 verse 4 and 6 through mashiach's death we are joined to mashiach even in his resurrected life such union enables us to serve in the new life of the spirit free from any adulteration 
How marvelous is the stake? It is the foundation for everything spiritual. The purpose and end of its working is to unite the believer spirit with the resurrected master into one spirit. This is the fusion that eventually takes place in us. The stake must go deeply to rid him of the sinful and the natural within him that he may be joined to the positive resurrection life of the master and thus become one spirit with him. A believer's spirit together with all uh, which is natural and transient in him needs to pass through death so that it may be purified and then united to become one spirit with the master in the freshness and purity of resurrection. So this is actually what resurrection means. But do we understand truly and clearly what resurrection actually means? How many people are teaching such in-depth information about resurrection? Not many. And that is why the Most High said to me to roll out this information and pass it on to my fellow brothers and sisters so that they get a deeper understanding in the things that they read about in scriptures. So th these teachings are truly helping you to renew your mind, to renew your spirit, to cleanse yourselves and to help you understand the path that you are on and what is about to happen and what is happening and what is being done by the Most High and His Spirit, the Holy Spirit or Ruach HaKodesh in you. And if you start to grasp this, then you come more and more in the mode that you allow this all to happen and you no longer will be of any hindrance to the process. And too much believers, too many believers are of a great hindrance to this process that is taking place within them by still being stuck in solical mind and emotion and thus stuck in the flesh. Uh, and the outcome will be to serve the master in newness of spirit. What is of the natural, of self, and of animal activities has no more place in the believer's walk and labor. Better said, you don't give a darn anymore about everything that is from the flesh which means you start to lose interest in worldliness, in worldly things. You start to lose interest in what the world is trying to demand you, to lure you in, because the flesh is connected with the world. What you also will see is eventually you start to... Uh, say more and more for yourself, you know what, it's nice what this person is saying, but I go to the Most High and I'm going to be in communion with Him and ask Him this and this and this and to teach me. So you are allowing more and more to be taught by the Most High Himself through His Holy Spirit or Ruach HaKodesh. 
And by doing so, you start to see that you are separating yourselves more and more and more. And start to become feeling more and more as a so-called outcast to this world. Because you're not of this world in the first place. So the spirit life uh, leaves its imprint on everything and everything speaks of the outflowing of the spirit of the master. So what you get is when people look at you, they don't look at you, they don't see you, they see the master, Yeshua, or better said, the universal father in you so shortly said we are coming more and more in the same situation that we eventually can say uh, if you see me you see the father at the same time because that is what we eventually are going to radiate to one and another especially to those who are not there yet This is ascension life. The believer is joined to the master who sits at the right hand of the Most High. The spirit of the enthroned master flows into the spirit of the believer. But the master got that spirit from his father the most high our universal father himself who is on the earth yet not of the world the enthroned life is accordingly lived out upon the earth the head and the body share the same life with such a union, he is able to pour forth the power of his life through the believer's spirit. As a tube which is connected to a fountain is able to convey living water, so too the believer's spirit, uh, which is united with the spirit of the master is capable of transmitting life. The master is not just the spirit, he is the life-giving spirit. As well, when our spirit is joined intimately with the life-giving spirit, it is filled with life. And as soon as you are being filled with life, all the interest that the carnal tries to lure you in doesn't have any meaning for you at all any longer. You just look at it and know it is carnal. And then you say, no flesh, I'm not falling prey to your ideas, thoughts, emotions, feelings, opinions, and whatsoever. I'm not letting myself being steered up by it. When our spirit is joined intimately with the life-giving spirit, it is filled with life and nothing can limit that life. How we need to have this in our spirit that we may triumph continually in our daily walk. Such a union clothes us with the victory of the master Yeshua. It gives us the knowledge of his will and mind. It builds and expands the new creation within us by the rich inflow of the master's vitality 
and nature. Through death and resurrection, our spirit ascends even as the Master has ascended on high and experiences the heavenly places. Having trodden all that is earthly underfoot, our inner being is in ascendancy, far above any obstacle or disturbance. Yet it is continually free and fresh and discerns everything with the transparent sight of heaven. How radically different this life of heaven on earth is from one that is swayed by emotions. And many believers are being swayed by their emotions, by their solical mind and emotion. The former kind displays heavenly nature and is persistently spiritual. How can you also see this, uh, that many believers are still uh, caught up in their solical mind and emotion, is when they constantly have the, uh, the need to go back to the past. That is done by the flesh, that is done by the soul. The past is the past, people. Leave it behind. Knowing the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Yahuwah's children already have the Holy Spirit abiding in them, but they may not recognize Him or obey Him. So, children of the Most High have already the Holy Spirit abiding in them. But the problem is they may not recognize Him. They may not recognize him or obey him they need to do so completely they must realize that this indwelling presence is a person because a spirit is a person it because she doesn't see the body around it doesn't mean that it's not a person. One who teaches, guides, and communicates the reality of Mashiach to them. Until they are willing to acknowledge the foolishness and dullness of their soul and are ready to be taught, they block the way of this person. So as long as you still feel that you need to defend yourselves, that you think that you're not this or that or not being proud, not being jealous, not being whatever, you are not in communion with this person known as the Holy Spirit or Ruach HaKodesh which is the Master Mashiach Spirit so then you are still staying stuck in your solical mind and emotion and because of this you block the way to communion with this person known as the Holy Spirit, which is Mashiach Yeshua, and actually, if we completely go back, is our Most High, our Etern um, our Universal Father. It is necessary for them to let Him regulate everything so as to reveal the truth except they know in the depth of their being that the Most High's Holy Spirit is indwelling them and unless with their spirit they wait for His teaching. They will not welcome His operation upon their life 
um, they will not welcome his operation upon their soul life. Only as they cease to seek anything by themselves and only as they take the position of the teachable shall they be taught. And many people are still seeking the things outside themselves. They are Googling everything and, and uh, they are doing what is then said, scripture study, study, but they're not studying the scripture because if they would do so, how can you then see that many believers after 10, 20, 30 years are still at the beginning point, are still standing at the same place as where they started. Something to think about, something to question. Um, so as soon as you start to cease that seeking, uh, and you know, you can, you can ask questions. I uh, many times drop questions and I know that I will get the answers as soon as I have progressed myself into a new level in my uh, um, spirit that understands the answer. That understands the answer, which means, better said, when I have progressed out uh, all more out of my solical mind and emotion and entered uh, an, another level in my spirit, then the answer comes and I will understand the answer because the answer is then fully understood by me as spirit, not by me as soul. And only as they take the position of the teachable shall they be taught by the spirit truth which they are able to digest because that truth is able to be digested <clears throat> um, we know he verily abides in us when we understand that our spirit which is deeper than thought and emotion is the most high holy of holies by which we commune with the Holy Spirit. And in which we wait for his communication as we acknowledge him and respect him. <coughs> he manifests his power Uh, out from the hidden part of our being by extending his life to our solical and conscious life. The believers at Corinth were of the flesh in exhorting them to depart from their carnal state paul repeatedly reminded them of the fact that they were yahuwah's temple and that the holy spirit lived in them so that is the the major teaching message and lesson the most high has given to us through paul who was speaking to these believers, fleshly believers, at Corinth. And this message still counts unto the day of today. But many people do not understand these messages because they are reading scripture from their solical mind and emotion. Knowing he indwells them helps believers to overcome their carnal 
condition. They must know and understand perfectly by faith that he abides in them. Believers should not be content merely with knowing mentally the teaching of the Holy Spirit as given in scriptures. They also need to know him experimentally. They will then commit themselves without any reservation to him for renewal and submit every part of their soul and body to his correction. The Apostle Paul put to those at Corinth this question, Do you not know that the Most High's Spirit dwells in you? Paul seemed to be surprised at their ignorance of such a sure fact. He viewed the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as the foremost consequence of salvation. So how could they miss it? Go for this to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. And read Corinthians now with this knowledge in your spirit. However low a believer's spiritual measure be, even as low as that of those believers at Corinth, alas, many probably do not rise higher than that. He nevertheless ought to be clear on this fact without which he shall long remain carnal and never become spiritual. Even if you have not yet experienced his indwelling, could you not at least believe he does abide in you? Can we refrain from worship, respect, and praise when we consider how the Holy Spirit, who is the Most High Himself, one of the three persons in the tree Yuan, the very life of the Father and the Son, comes to life in us who belong to the flesh, what favor for the Holy Spirit to dwell in the likeness of sinful flesh just as the Master Yeshua once took upon himself the same likeness. <clears throat> The strengthening of the Holy Spirit. In order for man's innermost organ to gain dominion over the soul and the body and thus serve as channel for the life of the Spirit to be transmitted to others, there must be His strengthening. Paul prays for believers that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 16. He so prays because he considers it infinitely important. He asks the Most High to strengthen by His Spirit their inner man, which is the new man in them after they have trusted in the Master. Therefore, the prayer is that the believer's spirit may be strengthened by the Most High's Spirit. From this, 
we may deduce that the spirits of some saints are weak while those of others are strong. Whether they are potent or impotent depends upon whether or not they have received his strengthening. Since those at Ephesus had been sealed already with the Holy Spirit, the Apostles' prayer for them must be concerned with the gift other than his indwelling. His prayer indicates um, they must have not only the Holy Spirit indwelling them, but also have his special power uh, inundating their spirit so as to render their inner man strong. It is possible for us to possess a weak spirit, although having Yahuwah or the, the, the universal Father, the Most High, indwelling us. It's the our universal Father that is indwelling us. That's the Most High. Uh, to be filled with a might in the inner man is the urgent need of believers. However, unless they appreciate how feeble theirs is, they will not ask for the invigoration of the Holy Spirit. Often the children of the Most High, the Universal Father, cannot rise up to answer the Master's call to service simply because though their physical condition is good, their feelings are low, cold, and reluctant. Or even when their emotions are quite high, passionate, and willing. Uh, they find themselves unable to serve the master because now the body reacts lazily. Such phenomena betray the weakness of the spirit in its dominion over feeling and the physical body. So, this is a good thing to question yourselves. Is the laziness and passiveness you experience uh, often in your life is that coming from a spirit or is it to do with what I have said right now? Because of your high state, emotional, passionate life. Such phenomena betray uh, the weakness of the spirit. All right. The disciples found themselves in precisely that situation in the Garden of Gethsemane. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Matthew 26, verse 41. Willingness by itself is not sufficient. The spirit also must be strong. If it is sturdy, it can overcome the infirmity of the flesh. Why do believers sometimes find themselves dragging and failing while laboring for souls? Lack of power in their spirit is the explanation. The same holds true in the case of environment, how easily we are affected by the confusion of the outside world, where our spirits hardy, were our spirits hardy, sorry, we would be able to meet the most disturbing situation with peace and rest. Well, that's something uh, none of us yet is really experiencing in such a way.
Prayer is the acid test of the inner man's strength. A strong spirit is capable of praying much and praying with all perseverance until the answer comes. A weak one grows weary and faint-hearted in the maintenance of praying. A vigorous spirit can move forward in the midst of adverse. Environment or feeling, but a frail one is impotent to stand against opposition. Great is the need of power in the spirit for spiritual warfare with Shatan. So that's how important it is that we become strong spirits and strong in our spirit. Only those who have might in the inner man understand how to exercise their spiritual strength in resisting and attacking the enemy. Otherwise, the battle will be make-believe, thought in the imagination of the mind or the excitement of the emotion and perhaps fought with the weapons of flesh and blood. In order for the inner man to be strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit, the children of the Most High, the Universal Father, must discharge their responsibility. They need to yield specifically to the Master. Forsake every doubtful aspect in their life. Be willing to obey fully to the Most High's will. And believe through prayer that He will flood their spirit with His power. Without delay, the Most High will answer the expectation of their heart once all obstacles on their part are removed. Believers do not need to wait for the Holy Spirit's filling because He has descended already. He has descended already. What they need only wait for is for themselves to fulfill the condition for His filling, which is they must let the stake perform a deeper incision upon them. Should they be faithful in believing and obeying, then within a very short time the power of the Holy Spirit or Ruach HaKodesh will saturate their spirit and strengthen their inner man. And so, not only that, it will strengthen their inner man for living and for laboring. Some may receive his filling immediately upon once surrendering themselves to the Master, for they already have met the conditions for such filling. This invasion of the Most High's power in us, this infilling of His Spirit, happens in the human spirit. It is the inner and not the outer man which is activated by His power and thence becomes strong. This is most important to recognize for it helps us to exercise simple faith in our desire for the filling of the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 3 verse 14 Rather than to anticipate some bodily sensations such as a shaking, a jerking, or a hurling to the ground. Yet, believers need to be watchful lest they use faith 
as an excuse for not experiencing the empowering of the Holy Spirit. The conditions for filling must be accomplished and the attitude of believers must be firm. The Most High will fulfill His promise. The effect of having the Spirit filled with, your, with the, the power of the Most High is to afford it full sway over the soul and the body. Every thought, desire, sensation and intent is now completely governed by the Spirit by the Spirit of the Most High, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, also known. The soul can no longer act independently, it becomes instead the Spirit's steward. So the Holy Spirit becomes a steward over our spirit and our soul and body. Keep that in mind. <clears throat> um, furthermore, through the believer's uh, spirit, the Holy Spirit is able to impart the Most High's life to thirsty and dying man. However, this filling of the Holy Spirit differs from the baptism with the Holy Spirit, because the latter is for the purpose of service, while the former solves the problem of life, and eventually will also affect service too. So, Do we now get a deeper understanding of what is truly happening uh, after immersion or baptization? All right, walking according to the Spirit, that's the last part. It will be a long, all these uh, uh, in-depth studies are so far an hour and 45 minutes at least. Walking according to the Spirit. Transformation from soulish to spiritual does not guarantee that believers never again will walk according to the flesh. Ooh. On the contrary, an ever-present danger exists of falling back into it. Shatan is constantly alert to seize every opportunity to cause them to plunge from their lofty position to a life below par. It is therefore highly necessary for the children of the Most High and thus of the Universal Father to be watchful at all times and to follow the Spirit so that they may remain spiritual. In order that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. Now, those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. And this is funny because many are uh, yelling this sentence, but if you look at them and at their lives, then they're not congruent. Then it's not in alignment with what they're saying. 
Are you truly focused on the things that are of the Spirit? Which means that you are not busy with your phone, watching television, uh, you know, constantly searching on the internet for finding answers and whatsoever. To set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. To set the mind on the flesh is hardships, striving, struggling, pains, emotions, restlessness, and constant tiredness. Romans chapter 8 verse 4 to 6 To follow the Spirit is to walk contrary to the flesh. Not following the Spirit is walking by the flesh. Many believers oscillate between these two, now following the one, then following the other. They ought to walk according to the inner man alone. which is to walk according to the Spirit's intuition and not for a moment according to the soul or body. In thus following the Spirit, they invariably shall set their minds on the things of the Spirit, and the result shall be life and peace. To live by the Spirit means to walk according to intuition. It is to have all one's life, surface, and action in the Spirit. Ever being governed and empowered by it. This preserves the saint in life and peace since he cannot remain in a spiritual state unless he walks according to the Spirit. Then, at the very least, the saint must understand its various functions and laws if he is to walk well. So to live after the Spirit is that the belief is the believer's daily task. He ought to perceive that we can live neither by the noblest of feelings nor by the loftiest of thoughts. So this means that you also stop thinking constantly. There are many believers whom are so stuck in their mind by uh, wondering about this, wondering about that, wondering about whatever. Ah, uh ah, -uh, don't do. Overcome this. We must walk according to the guidance accorded us through our intuition. The Holy Spirit expresses His feeling through our spirit's delicate sense. He does not operate directly on our minds, suddenly inducing us to think of something. And this, I want to state here also that there are so many people are striving with other believers in whom they see that that believer, that person is far more uh, progressed than they themselves are. Stop comparing yourselves with another person and his uh, progression in his spiritual life. Focus on your own spiritual life, not on the other person's life. Not comparing oh, like, yeah, but uh, you can hear him and, and, and you can feel him. Yeah, so you, you, you can hear him and feel him too if you were more focused on it. 
if you were more focused on the spirit, the spiritual humanness. And so we're more focused on him, the master, the Holy Spirit. We must walk according to the guidance accorded us through our intuition. The Holy Spirit expresses his feeling through our spirit's delicate sense. He does not operate directly on our minds, suddenly inducing us to think of something. All his works are done in our innermost depth. If we desire to know his mind, we should conduct ourselves in accordance with the intuition of our spirit. At times, however, we may sense something there without comprehending what it means, what it demands, or what it is communicating. Whenever this happens, we must commit ourselves to prayer, asking that our mind may be given understanding. And that I also want to say in this, because there are many believers who constantly ask other people like um, uh, questions and try to yeah, challenge other people to give them the uh, answer. But then you lack trust in the Holy Spirit and so in our Universal Father's power and understanding and wisdom and knowledge. And we need to stop placing questions on someone else's plate. If you have a question, ask it directly to the Holy Spirit. We need to learn to communicate with the Holy Spirit and so with the Spirit of our Universal Father instead of dropping questions on the plate of other humans. Because we still depend ourselves on a other flesh person. Once we apprehend the meaning of what we have sensed intuitively, we thereafter should behave accordingly. The mind can instantly be enlightened and made to understand the meaning of intuition, but abrupt thoughts which originate with the mind void of intuition ought not to be followed solely intuitive teaching represents the spirit's thought only this should we follow such a walk by the spirit requires reliance and faith faith to walk in this fashion requires faith of the believer. The opposite of sight and feeling is faith. Now it is the soulish person who gains assurance by grasping the things which can be seen and felt. But the person who follows the spirit lives by faith, not by sight. He will not be troubled by the lack of of human assistance. And if you rely on this, on a very beautiful example I think in this is, um, if I have something to deal with for which I need a solution for, then I ask my spirit, please give me the solution. Or I say, Father, give me the solution. But before I was immersed, I always say, okay, universe or spirit in me, um, give me the solution. And then uh, when I was still 
uh, stumbling with something, then I got this voice like, lay it aside. And then I was like, okay, I'll lay it aside. I laid it aside. And then a few hours later, uh, when I sit in, uh, in uh, my chair, enjoying a cup of tea, then all of a sudden, bam, the solution comes in. Why? Because at that moment, I'm in peace and I'm in connection and can communion with, uh, so my spirit can communion with the spirit of the Most High. And then the solution drops in my mind. And then I'm like, wow. Or when I want to buy something, I sometimes get, you don't have to because you have this and this already in your uh, shed, in your barn. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then I say, okay, if that is the case, please show me and lead me to it. And bam, I'm being led to it and being shown in, oh, yeah, that's, I was for, you know, uh, I com completely forgot that I had it already. So that is how you work. Or that I, at all of a sudden in the, in, in the middle of the night, I wake up and then I see myself doing things. And then I know, oh, I need to, as soon as I uh, start my day, I am, um, I need to clean the windows and do this and that. Or uh, I see myself cleaning up my fridge and then I know, okay, I have to clean up my fridge today. That is what the task is that I need to do at least this day. So that is how you work. All right, I proceed. Nor will, be, uh, nor will he be moved by human opposition. He can trust the Most High even in utter darkness, for he has faith in the Most High, because he does not depend upon himself. He can trust the unseen power more than his own visible power. So you can say that the challenges we all are in these days are challenges, 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 challenges um, to learn us to come in full trust with the Most High. So that is also what the end time is meant for. It is a great test for each and every person, believer and non-believer. Especially believers are being tested tremendously in this time now. In how deep is your faith in the Universal Father, the Most High? Uh, walking after the Spirit involves both the initiation of a work by revelation and execution of it through the Master's strength, the strength of Yeshua. Frequently, believers beseech the Most High for spiritual power to do a work which has not been revealed at all in their intuition. So never let yourselves being fooled by people who say, yeah, but it is about time for you that you uh, do this and uh, you know that you overcome this and yeah, you need to walk as Mashiach this, did and so you need to go onto the street and blah, blah, blah. If that is not really said by the Holy Spirit and thus by the Most High Himself to you in your spirit, it is because something else needs to be done first or He has a different purpose for you.
This is simply impossible for what is of the flesh is of the flesh. Mm. On the other hand, believers frequently know the will of the Most High through revelation in their intuition, but bring their own strength to the work to perform it. This likewise is also impossible, for how can they begin with the Holy Spirit and end up with the flesh? Those who follow the Master, Yeshua, must be brought to the place of no confidence in the flesh. They must confess they can originate no good idea and must admit they possess no power to fulfill the Holy Spirit's work. All thought, cleverness, knowledge, talent and gift which the world superstitiously worships must be completely set aside in order to enable one to trust the Master wholly. So better said, you are, uh, better said, you have to accept that you have to set everything that has to do with the flesh to set that aside and to begin with a blank page. Um, our aim is to be a spiritual man but not a spirit if we recognize this distinction our lives shall never be cut and dried We today are human beings and shall be so eternally. Well, eventually we will be lifted up um, out of this carnality and uh, become, and the, 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 the body, this, this fleshness will eventually disappear due to the transfiguration process we go through. And then we come back into the original state as Adam and Eve were before the fall and they before the fall they didn't saw this flesh so this is not really um, correct because it implies uh, that we are forever uh, be in the flesh but that's no, that is not true eventually we will come back to the original state Adam and Eve were before the fall and so then we have, be, have become a spiritual human still in a certain thing called body but not as we know it of today with organs and this and that in it because then we don't have to reproduct uh, all the uh, reproduction stops because we have eternal life so children bearing children are not needed anymore um, we become brothers and sisters and no longer uh, male female uh, in the sense of partner Um, so we be we will be sort of you can say Adam and Eve were an in-between version between an angelic being and an uh, you can say earthly being so their body was an in-between state not completely flesh because they need they didn't need to drink nor eat 
that was something yeah you could do but it was not a necessity as it now is today we need to eat and drink otherwise we die but before the fall they just could grab once a day a fig and uh, they ate and they were filled but the eating we then do is completely different because that is eating from the tree of life so we are eating things to to fulfill life and not because we need so otherwise we die no So the whole body thing becomes different and the body then is able to take up its minerals and nutritions from, the, from the, the, the light and from the water itself. The mind of the spiritual man likewise cooperates with the spirit, wandering no more as in the past. It does not object to the spirit's revelation by raising its reason and argument. Neither does it disturb the peace of spirit with many confused thoughts, nor does it rebel nor does it rebel against the spirit by boosting in its own wisdom. Quite the reverse, the mind cooperates fully with the intuition in advancing on the spiritual journey. If the spirit unfolds any revelation, the mind discerns its meaning. It will assist the spirit to fight uh, should the latter plunge into warfare. If the Holy Spirit desires to teach any truth, the mind will help the spirit to understand. So here you get how the mind is working in togetherness with the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is stewarding your mind. So the latter, though, has the authority to stop the mind's thinking as well as to imitate, um, as well to, oh, the latter, so the Holy Spirit, though, has the authority to stop the mind's thinking as well as to initiate it. That's what, what the sentence was. So the spiritual man also retains his will, yet it too is no longer independent of the Most High, but now decides according to the dictate of the Spirit, having abandoned self as its center. <clears throat> and as long as you are still in this self-centeredness, by complaining about this, by uh, uh, you know, um, um, by uh, being ruled by your feelings, your past, and whatever that your solical mind and emotions are doing with you, you are still self-centered. The will does not insist upon its desires as before. It consequently is fit to obey the Most High. No more is it hard and stiff, but is completely broken.
And what is the will? That is your naturalness, your natural strength. Hence it cannot resist the Most High or strive against Him. It has been tamed of its wild nature. And the body of the spiritual man is subjected to the spirit as well. Because it has been cleansed by the precious blood and has had its passions and lusts dealt with by the stake, it can serve today as an obedient servant to the spirit's order as that order is communicated to the body from the spirit through the soul. By no means does it entice the soul into many sins by its passions and lusts as it formerly did. Instead, the body now answers swiftly all the spirit's directions. The latter through the renewed will uh, has a uh, the latter, through the renewed will, has complete authority over the body. So this means the Most High, His Spirit, has the authority over the body. Gone are the days when the body pressed a weak inner man. The spirit of a spiritual man has grown strong and the body is under its power. He has the Most High dwelling in his spirit, sanctifying him totally, its life inundates his entire person so that his every component lives by the spirit life and functions in the spirit's strength. He does not live any longer by soul life. His every thought, imagination, feeling, idea, affection, desire, and opinion is renewed and purified by the Spirit and has been brought into subjection to His Spirit. These no longer operate independently. He still possesses a body, for He is not a disembodied Spirit. Yet physical weariness, pain and demand do not impel the spirit to topple from its ascended position. Every member of the body has become an instrument of righteousness. All right. As last, to conclude, then a spiritual man is one who belongs to the spirit, the whole man is governed by the inner man, all the organs of his being are subjected completely to it, his spirit is what stamps his life as unique. Everything proceeds from his spirit, while he himself renders absolute allegiance to it. No word does he speak, nor act does he perform according to himself rather does he deny his natural power each time in order to draw power from the spirit in a word a spiritual man lives by the spirit and with this said, I have come to the end of reading this very interesting teaching uh, of part 16 of the in-depth study series, The Spiritual Man. Please re-listen to it. There's a lot of food for your spirit in this, a lot of information to digest, uh, meditate upon it, and uh, I would say 
download the video, convert it to an mp3 so you can listen to it because it's not about my face, me sitting here in front of the camera, but it's about the information I bring forward and am allowed to pass on to you because the Most High asked me so. Um, thank you so much for doing a little donation. Know that if you do this, you will be tremendously be blessed by the Most High. And um, because giving a donation is actually giving something back to the Most High. And I wish you all a Baruch day. And do not forget to praise the Most High in everything you do. Baruch Abba Bashem Yahuwah. And I see you next time. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.